Hi friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name's Em and today we are going to do my July reading wrap up. And I'm gonna be honest, my kids just started playing Zelda so we have until they are done playing. So let's just get right in <laughs> on into this video so I can finish it in one go. July was kind of a funky reading month. Uh, I talked about it a little bit in my Instagram post that I did well, the day I'm filming this, but whenever. I basically said July was kind of a funky month. I had a couple of new favorites. I had some books that I really disliked, and it's been a long time since I have read multiple books in one month that I have actively disliked. It's common for there to be quite a few books that I'm kind of like meh about, but to really, really dislike them is unusual, but that's where we are. I had a lot of success with the horror I read this month, which was nice. Um, less success with my rereads. And I did a lot of rereading this month, not on purpose. It, it was just how it worked out. But anyways, um, so I read 20 books in July. My average rating was like a 3.84, so a little bit lower than last month. In June, I think my average rating was like a 4.1. So it definitely went down a little bit. The, the two star and the one star book that I read definitely contributed to that. And yeah, why don't we just get into it? I just have them in a pile on my bed. So we're just gonna go in the order that I grabbed them in, not necessarily the order that I read them in. Okay, let's start off with talking about the books that I read for Summerween this year. This was my first Summerween. I had a great time. Uh, as a baby horror reader, it <laughs> was fantastic. I'm excited to do it again next year and see if my preferences have changed or evolved in any way, if I'm still being drawn to the same authors or the same type of stories. It'll be interesting to now to next time have like an experience to compare it to. Uh, so the lowest of those books was I read The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Uh, this is, look, they say it's sci-fi. It's not sci-fi. I mean, barely, barely. It has like a toe over the line from historical fiction into sci-fi. Uh, and this is a retelling kind of of The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells. And in this, we are following Carlotta and Montgomery. Carlotta is the aforementioned daughter of Dr. Moreau, and Montgomery is Moreau's major domo of his estate. And I didn't like it. I gave it like two stars. It just, there were things that Marina Garcia did that really distracted me from the story. Okay, so you're alternating chapters between Moreau and Montgomery and the way Montgomery thinks about Carlotta, sorry, did I say Moreau? Carlotta Moreau. But the way Montgomery thinks about Carlotta as someone who is 15 years younger than him and who he met when she was a child, the way she thinks about her is kind of yucky. And nothing ever comes of it like he never does anything yucky but the way it the way he thought about her was so distracting and I, I spent so much time worrying about what was going to come of those thoughts I didn't feel like the writing was that great it was fine there were some structure choices that Moreno Garcia made that made certain parts really redundant and we were getting the same event and the same plot point multiple times and it just overall it was it was a miss for me I did not did not enjoy my reading experience sadly <laughs> hopefully the next one I read by her I will like a lot better. Um, and then I also for Summerween I read The Twisted Ones by T. King Fisher. I loved it. This is kind of a haunted house story, kind of a portal fantasy. Uh, we are following our main character, Mouse, whose grandma has passed away and her house 
is left and needs to be cleaned out and it falls on Mouse to do that because her dad is sick and can't go and take care of it. And it turns out grandma was a big old hoarder and the house is a disaster and Mouse needs to clean it up. But then there's also like things in the forest that shouldn't be there. There was a twist at the towards the end that I was not expecting and made it just totally unhinged on out and that was really fun and I just had a really good time with it. It wasn't scary for me. It was definitely spooky and there were some very unsettling scenes but I am very much a here for the horror vibes not the actual horror scare kind of reader right now so it was just just what I needed it to be so I had a great time with it. So read Into the Drowning Deep by Mira Grant. This has been on my TBR forever. This is the book that made me want to start reading horror because I really wanted to read this book about murderous mermaids and it was so close to being a five star. It was so close. So this book starts with found footage being recovered that uh, was taken on this ship that went out over the Mariana Trench and was making like a mockumentary about mermaids. Well, the mermaids found them. <laughs> and so the book opens with that found footage, really graphic and violent of this crew just being slaughtered. And then the sister of one of the people that was on the ship um, gets a chance to go out on another ship five years later uh, to find out what really happened. And boy, oh boy, did they find out. Um, and like I said, this was so close to being a five star, but there was a reveal at the end that Mira Grant made that was so, so cool. And then she didn't do anything with it. And it was such a letdown um, that I, I dropped it to four. I mean, it was a, it was a big, oh, big disappointment. <sighs> but yeah, otherwise if you, I mean, I loved so much of it. I would still recommend it because I think it's really good. I think that's got this really like, it's kind of slow, but in a, in like a dread and tension building kind of way. And I think Mira Grant did it really, really well. And then the last book I read for Summerween is You're Not Supposed to Die Tonight by Kaylin Bayron. And this is why a horror that is set at a horror movie reenactment camp where people pay to reenact the end of a fictional slasher film that exists in this universe. And our main character, Charity, she has been working at this camp for the last three years and it is the last night of the camp for the summer and staff members start to go missing. Uh, my complaint with this one is that it is short. It is not even 250. Yeah, it's 230 pages, including the acknowledgements. And for as short as it is, we don't get into the slasher until like the last 75 to 100 pages. But like, I vividly remember being on page, chapter 10 and looking at my husband and being like, we are on chapter 10 out of 15 chapters and there has been zero slash shitty slashing yet. So what are we doing? I do have a vlog for Summerween. I have two of them actually. So I will link them down below if you want more in-depth thoughts of the four books that I read for Summerween. Uh, because I think I'm going to be more eloquent in those because it's really fresh versus my poor brain and memory struggling to remember what exactly happened. <laughs> a month ago. So I reread, even though I knew the end, Where the where the Drowned Girls Go, What Moves the Dead, and Into the Riverlands, all for my Hugo novella finalists video. Uh, so I will link those that down below as well because I do talk about these way more in depth. These are all rereads. I was just really trying to refresh my brain so I could talk somewhat intelligently about the Hugos this year. But these were all within the four star range for me. Real quick, 
I'll, d I'll just do real quick. Rapid fire. Um, so Into the Riverlands is book three in the Singing Hill Cycle. So we are continuing to follow Cleric Chi and Almost Brilliant. And in this one, Chi is forced to be part of a story that is taking place instead of just collecting stories of events that have already happened. Uh, what Move is the Dead by T. King Fisher is an extension of Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe. Where the Drowned Girls Go by Shauna McGuire is book something, seven? Sure, maybe. Seven in the Wayward Children series. And in this one, we follow Cora. And because of the events of previous books, Cora is choosing to leave Eleanor West's home for wayward children and go to the White Thorn Institute and that's all I'm gonna say. And then even though I knew the end by C.L. Polk is a sapphic noir murder mystery set in Chicago. And then the other two books I reread in July is I continued my uh, murder bot reread. I reread um, Exit Strategy and then I skipped Network Effect and I read Fugitive Telemetry because chronologically story-wise the events of Fugitive Telemetry take place before the events of Network Event, Net, Network Effect and I remember being really discombobulated when I first read Fugitive Telemetry because I wasn't expecting to go back in time. And Wells doesn't tell you you're going back in time. She just drops you in and was like, good luck. So I read them slightly out of order, which felt like a good choice. And I'm really excited to read Network Effect. I talked about my disappointment. Let's talk about the other disappointment. Um, it was Ogres by Adrian Tchaikovsky. I'm not going to go too in depth to this because if you watch my Hugo novella video, I rant about this book for longer than I would have liked to rant about it. So basically this is told in second person present and it takes place on an earth-like place where there are these villages that are kind of medieval in tone. They don't have a lot of technology. They're very religious. They're rarely patriarchal. So they feel kind of medieval in that sense. And um, every village has a landlord and the landlords are all ogres and ogres to punish humans who step out of line sometimes eat them. And I hated it. I also read two classics in July. I read The Odyssey, uh, the Emily Wilson translation, and I read this uh, alongside Novel Pairing Podcast. They did a slow down summer buddy read of the Odyssey and I joined their Patreon and I got all this like exclusive content content for close readings and analysis of the Odyssey and it was absolutely fantastic. It's the first time I've read this and it is definitely not what I thought it was going to be <laughs> based off of all the different adaptations and retellings and modern interpretations and the Greek mythology books that I read as a child and Greek mythology books that I have read to my own children as they are going through Greek mythology phases. So it it was very different. It did not start where I thought it was going to start and it did not end where I thought it was going to end. But I got a lot out of this reread and I thought it was really interesting to see what language Emily Wilson chose for her translation and just the style choices that she made. I haven't read obviously another edition or another translation. I had a good time. I kind of loved how infantile she made the gods sound in a lot of their interactions, like so whiny, <laughs> which I think is fair. And I, yeah, I have um, very different feelings about Odysseus than I did before I read this. Very interesting. I am a big fan of reading classics in a community or with some sort of guide, whether it's a podcast or I guess not a class. I haven't read a classic in conjuncture with a class where I felt like I got a lot out of it, but it's been a long time since I was in school. So there's that too. This is the second classic I've read alongside a podcast and I really love it. I get so much out of them when I do it that way. 
so much context, so much history. I think it's always better to tackle a classic with a group than by yourself. Other classic I read is The Pillow Book by Say Shonigan. I, I got that name so wrong, but this is a Japanese work of literature by a Japanese noblewoman who lived approximately on the year 1000. <laughs> so it is like as classic as you can get, I feel like. And um, she primarily wrote it for her own amusement. And then it was found by one of her friends and they distributed it out to the court. Um, but it's a really interesting mix of like lists and antidotes and stories of like the shenanigans she and her fellow noble people get up to. And it was just really, like I haven't read anything like this before. So it was totally new. Like an example of the list is she says, things that a house should have, an elbow shaped corridor, spiral weave straw cushions, low standing curtains, good quality ladies attendants, serving trays, legged screens, Chinese style umbrellas, a cabinet with drawers, sake, petal, sake kettles and pots. So like, <laughs> some of them are really practical, some of them are really silly, some of them are kind of existential, but uh, I very impulsively bought this last year because I wanted to read more classics by women of color. So it was on my self-destructing TBR, so I'm really glad I read it. Uh, the other book that was on my self-destructing self TBR that I finished is The Bridge Kingdom by Daniel L. Jensen. Um, this is the first book in a fantasy series. And in this, we are following Lara, who is one of, is it 12 sisters or 20 sisters? I can't remember. But she's one of a bunch of sisters. <laughs> Um, and they are all daughters of the king and he has raised them all secluded in this desert fortress training them to be spies and assassins so that the best of them can marry the prince a of a rival kingdom and help their father take over that kingdom. Um, so we're follow Lara who is the daughter that survives that ordeal and is then betrothed to, what is his name? Aaron. Yes. It ends on a big cliffhanger. I don't know if I will keep going. I had a lot more fun with it than I was expecting to. I feel like I got irritated about something towards the end. Oh, I think I got really predictable. And then at the halfway mark, Lara does something and I remember thinking, well, there's only one way this is gonna go unless the author gets really creative. And the author did not get creative. So <laughs> it had a very predictable uh, climactic event. It had a very predictable cliffhanger ending. And I just don't know if I'm interested enough to keep going. I don't have any other of the books in the series and I probably will unhaul this because I don't see myself rereading it, but I did have a fun time, mostly. And I am glad that I read it. Finally, I have one more book that I didn't love and then everything else was a big old hit. So let's do the one I didn't love first. All right, the one I didn't love, the other one I didn't love is The Spare Man by Mary Robinette Cole. This is uh, one of the Hugo finalists for this year. I just read this in my reading vlog that went up on Wednesday. So I will also link that down below. <laughs> if you want more in-depth thoughts. But this is a sci-fi murder mystery. And I think Mary Robinette Cole does characters really well. I really like the dis disability rep that is in this book. I really like the dog that she has in this book. This is the best writing for a dog in a book that I think I've ever read. And I just think the murder mystery wasn't the actual mystery wasn't done as well as everything else was. So it was fine. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't great. It was fine. God, I'm so excited about everything else that's on this stack. Ugh. I also read Camp Damascus by Chuck Tingle. I have a reading vlog 
just for this book. I was so excited. This is one of my most highly anticipated books that came out this year. Um, this is horror. I am not sure where the uh, breakdown is for novella versus novel or novelette or what any of that is. So I don't know if this counts as a novella or if it's just long enough to be a novel. But um, this is about Rose. Is her name Rose? <laughs> yes. Okay, her name is Rose. So this is about Rose who lives in a small town and is part of a very conservative religious sect. And uh, without giving too much away, uh, Rose basically discovers that things are not as she remembers them. And she sets out to try to figure out why her memory is not lining up with reality. And it was really good. I did feel like it ended a little too quick. Also, if you have a thing about bugs, there's a lot of bugs in this book. And say religious trauma and like gay conversion camps are a central theme and plot in this book. So if you have religious trauma, uh, just keep that in mind. If you decide to read this, you'll be able to tell within like the first two chapters if it's going to be too much for you or if you'll be okay for the, the long haul. I also read Small Miracles by Olivia Outwater. This is uh, indie published. Uh, this is the same author as Half a Soul, which I read last summer and I really loved. And this is about angels and demons and temptation and friendship and, and grief and forgiveness and acceptance and so many things, but we're following Gadriel, who is a fallen angel who has a gambling problem and makes a bet with another angel that she can tempt a mortal named Holly, who has a sin deficit to sin more. And it's kind of sapphic. I don't know. There's this interesting thing that Atwater did with the angels where their concept of gender is super fluid. And so Gabriel very easily switches back from being a man and being a woman. And Holly and most of the people in this book are so delightfully unbothered by Gabriel just flipping back and forth. I found that entirely delightful. So it was it was pretty great. I had a lot of fun with this one. And I now kind of want to reread Half a Soul because... I like Olivia Atwater's writing so much. I also read book two in the Scary Stories for Young Foxes series. This, <laughs> this is called The City. And this Scary Stories for Young Foxes is the book, first book is scary and creepy, like far creepier than some of the adult horror I have been reading lately. But in this one, Christian McKay Heidecker goes dark like super dark where I know I know from being a bookseller that there are kids who want dark and creepy and this is I think appropriately dark and creepy for 8 to 12 year olds but it caught me off guard <laughs> how dark and creepy it is but these are what appear to be a collection of short stories being told by an adult fox to fox kits and then um in this one as well as the first one you get about halfway and then you um start to realize how they are connected all right and then we are going to end with the two nonfiction books that i read i read the face maker by lindsay fitz harris this is one of my favorite 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 nonfiction authors she writes medical nonfiction. she's my favorite like i said i love how she writes uh, and i find her books to just be fascinating. So this one is about plastic surgery during World War One and the reconstructive surgery that uh, surgeons were doing on the face of faces of soldiers who were wounded in battle. So cool. So interesting. It's and and interesting to see where her first book about jo Joseph Lister and uh, anesthesia being developed and uh, cleanliness in hospitals starting to become a thing where the the events that happened 
during that time period intersected with stuff that happened later in World War One. Absolutely fascinating. I learned a lot. I love how she writes these real people who don't get the recognition that they should get for the advances that they made for modern medicine. I just ugh, loved it. I recommend The Butchering Art, her first book, so much. It's still my favorite nonfiction book. But this one was still a five star. It was it was fantastic. And then the last book that I'm going to talk about for this wrap up and is probably my favorite book that I read all month is Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again by Johan Hari. This is what the title says. It's about why we are finding it harder and harder to pay attention and why it gets harder every year for us as humans to focus. I started reading this from the library and had tabbed so much that I just bought my own copy because I got so much out of this. This is not self-help. Johan Hari does not have any more self-control than the rest of us do. He does not have more ability to focus. He is struggling with the rest of us and is just asking questions and doing the research and trying to figure out why this is so hard. And I loved it. I felt <laughs> seen. I felt like I wasn't alone. I thought he had some really interesting science to back this up and then also really interesting personal anecdotal stories. And I like that he acknowledged how much your socioeconomic status plays into this because if you are struggling to put food on the table, that kind of stress is going to affect your ability to focus so much and there's not a whole lot you can do about it if you're working four jobs and struggling to bake ends meet and support your kids and all those things. So he's good about calling out when the coping mechanism is from a place of privilege. And I really just absolutely loved it. I highly recommend his audiobook too. I loved listening to him. It felt like a long podcast episode. And if you would like to be like, if you'd like to get like a snippet to find out if you you think this would be a good book for you. He was on an episode of Offline with John Favreau back in January, I think. And that podcast is about how the internet is breaking our brains. And so he was on that podcast. It's an hour long. He tells the story in that podcast. That is the intro for this book. Um, so if you listen to that podcast and you like what he has to say and you like his voice, <laughs> then I would really recommend picking up this book. I put it off for a long time because I was really worried that it was going to be kind of like, well, you have to get off your phone, that being the answer. And that is not the answer because it's much more nuanced than get off your phone. But also, like, get off your phone. I'm a big old hypocrite. Don't listen to me. Anyways, highly, highly recommend this book. So that is it. We did it. 20 books. And I need to read less. I said in June, did I say in the video or did I say it to myself, that I needed to read fewer books in July because the 22 books that I read in June felt really overwhelming to have to wrap up. And I only read 20 this month, but it's still really overwhelming to try to wrap up 20 books. So I'm gonna try to read less next month, like 15 or 16 books, tops. We'll see how I do. But anyways, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for spending your precious time with me. I really appreciate it. And if you want to leave an emoji, let's do the yellow emoji. Any yellow emoji would be fine since it's summer and, you know, sun is yellow. My favorite flowers are sunflowers and those are yellow. So let's, let's do yellow. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day or week or wherever you are in the flat circle that we call time. And I will talk to you all in the next one. Bye.